which you just type in to open up various applications. Sure. But, um, the uh, vocalized program was well. That was uh, quite an advancement to uh, to access these computers, and we used that until the Windows came out, uh, Windows three point one, and then they uh, got a program called JAWS, uh, J A W S, and it uh, is an acronym for JAWS or Job Access with Speech, and IRS, uh, Social Security, a lot of big companies like that would use this. JAWS program to uh, have their blind employees work with them. Before they had the blind uh, the blind employee employees before would just uh, use Braille. Uh, they had uh, volume after volume after volume of Braille yeah. around their cubicle, and uh, you know they'd have all the codes in there, the IRS codes and uh, information, and they know exactly where to go to look it up and. Uh, when you call for information at IRS and you got a blind person, you know, it may take you a little while to get the answer that you want. And, well, I tell you, these computers really made a lot of difference. They don't have any Braille hardly at all now. Uh, but when I, the, the, the whole, the whole JAWS program, uh, when, when it went to, when the computer program went from DOS to Windows, you were amazed with this. You fell in love with it. You really worked with it. And you came, became somewhat of a, localized expert at it i wouldn't say it's an expert i would i was proficient you're proficient okay yeah. there we go See, denny's uh, a very modest man he's not going to take any uh yeah, any well, accolades uh, modest to a certain extent but now, 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 now <laughs> so you you became proficient at it to a point where the folks at microsoft were talking to you well i had uh some people come to me uh, right from microsoft just saying you know what can we do to make this better or uh, how do we work this? And, you know, I'd give them suggestions and um, information, and, and, you know, they would take it and use it. Um, then um, I did get a contract with the Columbia Lighthouse for the Blind out of Washington, D.C., and was able to travel uh, nationwide um, for, gosh, I don't know how long I did that. I guess about 15 years maybe. As and part of their training program? Right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, IRS and Social Security would hire blind people. And my job would be going to set up their computer and then teach them on how to use it, train mm-hmm. them uh, how to use uh, the programs that they use uh, for IRS and Social Security. And of course, JAWS would be the main um, main thing that they would use. And they had Braille displays. Uh, Braille display is a very complicated uh, piece of equipment that displays in Braille what's on, on the screen. It's a refreshable so as you arrow down, it would refresh on the Braille display and, and change in Braille what was uh, reading on the screen. So mm-hmm. um, those are very costly, like $10,000 just for the Braille display. Uh, but, you know, IRS and Social Security would pay for that, uh, give job accommodation to uh, to the blind. Well, yeah. and, and I, I love it when you tell this story because, again, here's a guy, blue-collar worker, who can see the next day, He's a blue collar worker who can't see. Mm-hmm. And then you go from a blue collar worker to a, a techie type of guy. Oh, and by the way, you're blind. <laughs> I mean, to, to me, it's just, it's just an amazing story. And, and when I, when I hear people say, I can't do this, or this is too hard, or there's no good jobs out there or, or, or on and on and on. I think I got guys like you who through tons and tons of difficulties succeeded with a capital s well james i'm i know you're not going to brag this is me talking not you i don't i've gotten to where the word amazing is uh uh uh, it's i don't know i'm not amazing i'll say that for sure How, Uh, how how about uh the things that you've accomplished are amazing in the eyes of others will you accept that? it could be in the eyes of others but they have to understand you know that you you do what you do because you have to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if they were faced with the same situation, they probably could do the same thing if if they had to. Um, I was telling Angel up here on on the way up. Uh, I said, "You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit." You know, <laughs> <laughs> and you you don't. You know, you just go with it. You live with it. I love that serenity prayer. Uh, to me, I first heard that back in 1967, I believe when a friend of mine lost uh, uh, a really close uh, 
close loved one, and uh, he had that ser- serenity of prayer. Somebody gave that to him, and and that's meant so much to me over the years. You know, you you um, accept what you can't change, and uh, if you can change it, you will change it. You can change it. You try to change it, but if you can't, then you accept it. Yeah, and, and then you got to know the wisdom, have the wisdom to know the difference between the two things. And therein lies the rub. Many people yeah. don't know the difference between the two. If yeah. you can't change it, don't worry about it. Right. If Just you can on. change it, get to work. Yeah. And I, I felt like I could uh, make a difference in my life. And once I did it in mine, James, I wanted to do it in others. And we, uh, Danger and I traveled quite a bit helping other people. Um working with, uh, you know, their computers of worth uh, with a guy this past week in North St. Louis and he's in a wheelchair and, uh, blind and, uh, you know, working with him to get his computer going. And so he can be more independent in, in the things that he does. It's to me, it's all about independence, uh, being able to do things on your own without the assistance of others. I don't drive of course, and I have angels to do the driving for me, but she's not always around. And, you know, there's, I l- I've lost that independence. That's probably the thing that I miss more than anything else, uh, being blind, is the ability to just go out, get in the car, run up town to get a gallon of milk or just to take a drive or whatever. You know, I'm stuck uh, there at the, home, at the house by myself and no way to go if I, even if I wanted to go. But th- that's that's the thing that I really miss more than anything. So, uh, But when I'm there... I try to keep busy doing what I can. Um, I think you saw the article that I posted uh, on Facebook about the iOS training that we have coming up. I uh, did. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's uh, of course, uh, Apple's come out with a new um, operating system, 13, and it's supposed to include, and it does, uh, quite a few changes for blind people. A uh, program, uh, an app called VoiceOver that speaks the... Um, screen to uh to the blind every iphone has it on there that's just not activated but uh we are offering some seminars around the state um i say we that's uh rita howes and myself um she's a very knowledgeable young lady on uh, the iphone we'll be traveling to several different uh, locations around the state to offer a free course on uh, using the iphone the basics of voiceover and uh, the advanced um, acquisition of uh, iOS 13 and teaching people how to use that a little more uh, than what they're using it now. So we have uh, the month of October just pretty well booked. Um, Sedalia, Missouri, Joplin, Missouri, Sykeston, Missouri, two in St. Louis, Missouri, St. Charles, uh, different places like that will have seminars. And it's uh, not only for the blind, but for sighted people too. I had Four ladies called me today um, that are sighted that want to take this course. And I uh, said, so sure, you know, that's fine. Um, it's just a one-day um, seminar that we'll be focused on, and uh, pre- we provide lunch, and it's free of charge. Uh, well, we charge $5. You might as well say it's free of charge. <laughs> but uh, It's free, only $5. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's free for five. So, <laughs> Well, here you are at age 70 embracing and not just embracing and learning, but embracing learning and teaching new technologies. Uh, what advice would you give to anybody out there who says, ah, I'm too old to learn this. Now, granted, this person may be 40. Okay. Are you really ever too old to learn? No. Um, depends on your desire. Um, it depends on how much you really want to learn. I have had, um, couple of ladies that were in their 90s that um, I have trained. Uh, one lady in particular, Ida Scotty, uh, she's still alive. She's 99 now. And uh, I worked with her probably about six years ago, mm-hmm. teaching her how to do Facebook because she wanted to keep in touch with her grandkids, you know. And that's the beauty of it, James. You know, these older people or anybody really that 
is not able to get out and not able to go see their grandkids or whatever, you know, you can you can show them how to uh, do these things, and, and it just makes her life. It really does. So now Ida, at age 99, she can she too can argue with strangers and show <laughs> pictures of her cat. Yep. All that, all that, yeah. All sorts of I'm other not sure how Facebook much she things. does right now. She's, uh, <laughs> she's kind of gone downhill a mm-hmm. little bit, but, you know, back uh, five, six years ago, she was – she was right there doing it. Good yeah. for her. Yeah. Good. So Good it depends, her. you know, how much a person wants to do. Uh, they have to have that determination and motivation and just the mindset to to make the, the move and to do what they need to do, what they want to do. So I know I, so my, I always said, uh, well, I'd love to be able to play the piano. And one guy said, no, you don't. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if you wanted to play the piano, you'd be playing it. You would learn how. And I said, well, you know, you're right. He has I, a point. I, I never did practice. I never did attempt to learn. So I really didn't want to learn. Mm-hmm. I just wanted it just to fall into my lap and be able to play it, you know. <laughs> so maybe, yeah. maybe after you uh, you lose all the weight you gain from quitting smoking and uh, maybe stop one of your 17 jobs, maybe you'll learn to play the piano one day. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think I want to learn that bad now. <laughs> I got too many other things I want to do. So. Let's talk a minute about radio. Okay. Uh, you've been involved in radio for a long time. And when I say radio, of course, I talk, I, I don't mean radio, the appliance. I mean radio, the uh, the audio uh, vehicle. Uh, it can be a CD. It can be a podcast. It can be anything. But you've been involved with radio and doing a broadcast of some sorts for, for how long? Oh, goodness. First. Uh, time that I ever went on a- the air uh, live, I guess it was, was back in 1968. Um, I did a church program. So you were on the radio be- before you became blind? Yes. I, oh, okay. I, I sure was. Yeah. Um, I did a Bethel Baptist Church out in Lonedale, had me to do their uh, half hour weekly Sunday morning radio show. So I would uh, record uh, a preacher and uh, take that over. And that, that was on reel to reel back then. We didn't have cassette tapes even, <laughs> but uh, we did it on reel to reel. I'd take that over, pick out a couple of songs for him to play off of an album. And um, that's when uh, KLPW had a, a manned uh, studio on Sunday mornings. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, my first experience with it, and I did that for a few years. Um, and then uh, just off and on uh, with uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church, we did uh, some recordings and did uh, radio shows that way, but really got into it in 1990 when I did a program called The Songs of Zion. It was a, a two-hour program on Sunday mornings um, on KLPW. And uh, did uh, a lot of music, a lot of gospel music. Um, did that for 16 years, I guess. Now, was that done live in studio back then? Well, we started out uh, just doing it on cassette tape. Um, actually, I said it was uh, two hours. Uh, what was it, two hours or one hour? I can't remember, but I know um, that was one hour because uh, I used um, uh, two 90-minute tapes uh, so I could record um uh, the first half hour on one side, and then he wouldn't have to flip it over. He could just go to the second tape on the on the second side, uh, the second half hour, because I couldn't get a whole hour on one side of a tape. Right. So, but uh, yeah, it was done on cassette tape, and uh, then a few years later, we started doing it on CDs, and uh, you could do you know a one hour program on a CD. So it was nice to be able to just burn it to a CD and take that over to him and drop it off. Of course, we had to drive over there and take it over every every week and uh, drop it off to him. And then, uh, gosh, at the end, uh, we started doing Dropbox, just uh, started recording it, uploaded to Dropbox, and then they would download it. And that was, that was great. You know, didn't have to make the trip over there, didn't have to wor- worry about a CD, just save it as an MP3 file and, and uh, upload it to Dropbox. Sure. So, and that's what we do today. I, I currently do a, a radio show, a podcast. I call it a Godcast, uh, but uh, it's um, gospel music. I do it with a friend of mine from Joplin, Missouri, uh, Chip Haley. We use uh, Zoom, uh, 
we connect together on the computer. Uh, he's in Joplin. I'm in St. Clair and, um, work it together and, uh, just bring it into my mixer and then out to the uh, computer to record into a program called sonar. And it's a multi-track recording program. And so I can assign him a track and myself a track and put a music on a couple of other tracks and, uh, just 